Hello, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Manuel Ortiz. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for First Pathway Partners. And today we're going to be talking about the United States EB-5 program and the reasons it is rising in popularity for South Africans. Now, before I get to introducing our panel, just to provide a little bit of a brief background on EB-5, it's a program that got started in the 1990s to spur economic development in the United States. It allows for the applicant, spouse, and unmarried children under the age of 21 to obtain permanent U.S. residency. After two years, if the investment is maintained and has created at least 10 jobs, the investor becomes a permanent green card holder. But before we get started, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists, um, Karen Lee Pollock, Chris Hatting, and Sonia Clark. And maybe we can start with Karen and then everybody can uh, follow on just after that. But Karen Lee, you and I have known each other for many years worked together for many years. For those of you that don't know Karen, she has a wealth of knowledge in EB-5, but also just immigration in general. And Karen, maybe if you could give us a brief introduction. Thank you for your kind words, Manuel. Yes, we've worked together. We've even done seminars in South Africa together. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I am South African. I have lived in the United States for over 26 years. I uh, grew up, I was born and raised in South Africa. I got my law degree from WITS. Um, I came over, I met my husband who's American. I had, now have two children who are American. One lives in Israel, one lives in America and is a college here. I have an immigration boutique which is located in Dallas, Texas. We specialize in business, investment, employment, and family immigration to the United States. We represent Fortune 500 companies down to small mom and pop uh, businesses that want to bring in workers to live and work permanently in the United States. So um, not only do I know the law, but I know firsthand what an emotional and sometimes costly experience it is moving your family from one country to another. Timing is everything. Sometimes that is outside of your control with the government. Uh, immigration in the United States is like any government department all over the world, very bureaucratic. So we sometimes at their mercy. Um, as I said, we specialize in EB-5 and E-2 investment immigration. E-2 is not actually available to people with South African passports. So that is what I do. I've had this my own boutique for approximately seven years. Um, I chaired the immigration section of the largest, one of the largest law firms in the world, America Bound immigration for many, many years. I then went to a regional firm. And in 2017, we opened up our practice. And this is my little labor of love. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. And, and Sonia? Yes, Manuel, thank you. And uh, Karen, nice to um, get a holistic uh, introduction in terms of uh, your background and what you do. So thank you. Um, yes, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I'm the regional director for First Pathway Partners. And um, yes, I actually started my journey in EB5 in 2010. So um, yeah, and then joined First Pathway Partners um, five years ago. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of experience in terms of working with some immigration attorneys in the past. Um, just listening in to the different visa categories and um, yes, and when First Pathway Partners came to South Africa in 2018, uh, Dan Wickland, which is uh, now Vice President, um, well, sorry, he's our president, he's just uh, been promoted, um, said to me, well, I fit the team well, would I please join the, the FPP team? And that's where the journey started. And I've been delighted in working with many South African EB-5 investors. So I do have a few stories to tell. And um, yeah, I'm going to hand you over back to Manuel, over to Chris, and uh, I'll tell you a bit more of it later. Hey, thank you for that lovely introduction. And Chris, you're also located in South Africa. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself as well. 
Thank you very much, Manuel, and uh, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to participate and discuss some of these issues um, afflicting and affecting South African citizens at the moment. So I'm based in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. I work at the Center for Risk Analysis. Basically, we pull data from as many sources as we can, things like the IMF, the World Bank, the Reserve Bank of South Africa, and we assist our clients to assess the risks in um, their given location. We've got a footprint in sub-Saharan Africa. It's also touching on global issues because, of course, we live in a globally connected world. So things in the US and China will affect things in South Africa quite uh, intimately. So we try and assist with the scenario planning, trying to figure out where the risks are coming from. Um, the fun thing about the scenario planning is I can tell you to plan accordingly for each scenario. Each one is 100% possible, so you should prepare accordingly, and hopefully we can try and assist in that particular way in today's discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Chris. And I think as we talk about EB-5, one, I just briefly mentioned what it is, uh, but it's something that is really near and dear to my heart. I started in EB-5 in, in 2013. And as I was thinking about the EB-5 program, I remembered my grandfather when he first came to the United States back in the early 1900s, him and his brother owned one of the largest candle making companies in uh, Spain, but they both wanted to come to the US. And so you only had two options on how to handle coming to the US at that time when you were in that situation. It was either fighting it out or flipping a coin. And so fortunately, I come from a very loving family and they flipped a coin and my grandfather won. And he came to, through Ellis Island, went to New York, um, then went to Philadelphia and then into LA and started a uh, small hotel there. Then he migrated to Texas and founded a uh, dairy farm there. And if you think about, you know, what he did and how he got here, you know, he invested in the US, right? He migrated to the US, he created jobs, but were it not for the win of the coin toss, which is a 50-50 proposition, right? He would have never been here and maybe I would never be here. And when you think about EB-5 and partnering with an EB-5 firm like FPP that has a 100% success rate for investors in securing the permanent green card, you have a much better chance than the 50-50 that my grandfather did. And you're also creating jobs. Like I mentioned what the EB-5 program is actually about. It was done to basically create economic development in the US. Uh, if you think about it, you know, it really didn't start getting popular until about 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession and just really started soaring in, in popularity. Um, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, the EB-5 program, what type of, of investor or a person would be if even interested in EB-5? And Karen, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what you see when clients first come to you uh, and, and want to learn about EB-5, what are some of those motivations? Well, there's various, various motivations across the gamut. Um, the EB-5 is only one type of visa that can allow people to come live and work permanently in the United States. There are several other options available. For some people, the EB-5 is the visa of last resort because they do not have other options available to them. For the majority of EB-5 investors, it's a visa for high net worth individuals. As everyone may know, the minimum amount of the investment is $800,000 which is a significant amount of money um, for an investor, particularly with the exchange rate in South Africa, that is a substantial amount of money. Not many people have $800,000 to invest and have it tied up until they get their green card. In, in most cases, uh, people have their own personal reasons for immigrating, no matter what type of visa it is. But for a lot of EB-5 investors, they have their own businesses already, they're retired, or um, they are not financially dependent on that money for a certain period of time. And that's why the EB-5 is favorable to them. Today, we're going to discuss the EB-5 investment through a regional center like First Pathways. However, there is another type of EB-5 visa, which we're not going to touch on again where you, today, where you would invest in your own business. 
the amount of the investment would be a minimum of 800,000 up to 1,050,000. You have to create your own business, invest the money, have somebody run that business until you get here and eventually create 10 full-time jobs. Today, we're focusing on the regional center and we'll get into the weeds of that later. But the beauty about that is if you go with a regional center with a proven successful track record, you basically invest your money and wait for your green card. So that is the motivation for a lot of people. They're not familiar with business laws and setting up businesses in the United States. And they don't want to take that risk of setting up a business. They'd rather have an experienced management firm manage their investment, make sure that the jobs are created, vet the, the, lend, the borrowers of the money, make sure they're working on projects that can be created so that um, the success rate is high, um, if not yeah, I don't like to say the word guaranteed because nothing in life is guaranteed and under the regulations you can't guarantee an investment, but you want to make sure that it's a regional center with a proven track record, not only in the first stage, but on the final stage as well. So um, for South Africans, though, it's the, uh, it's the investment of the 800,000. You've got to factor onto that administrative fees to manage the investment and then legal and government filing fees. So it's, um, you know, can add up. And as I said, with the exchange rate, that adds up pretty quickly. Thank people you so much for that, Karen. different motivations, though, for South Africans. Um, a lot of people, it's, it's really, they're very happy with their lives in South Africa. It's really investment for their children. Uh, they want their kids to be educated in the United States. Chris can go on more about the risks. Um, I have a lot of Chinese investors for them. The motivation is clean air. They want clean air for, um, because of pollution. Um, other countries, it's warm torn countries like the Ukraine or Russia. Uh, so everybody has their own motivations. Other people, it's just as simple as I want to reunite with family who already live in the United States. And, and Karen, one of the things that, that you alluded to, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the steps as, as well. But, you know, one of the things that you alluded to as well is you have the direct versus the uh, regional center uh, program as well. And I think, you know, one of the advantages, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about this, is that, you know, through a, a company like First Pathway Partners, I think there's a uh, major distinction there where this would be considered more of a passive in investment uh, with somebody that's done this for, you know, we got founded back in, in 2008, right when the program started rising in uh, popularity. Um, but it would be more of a passive investment. And then you also get uh, credit for both the direct and the indirect jobs uh, as well, correct? So it, it may be um, a little bit more conservative from that standpoint, because, you know, we all know whenever you're starting a business, you know, sometimes being able to maintain full-time jobs by definition throughout the process and the time that you need to uh, can be a bit of a difficult thing. That's a great point. So for regional centers, um, you can rely on indirect jobs. So you, the actual, let's say the money is loaned to a hotel, to a uh, hotel commercial real estate developer to develop a Hyatt hotel. I'm just making that name up. They can rely in counting the 10 jobs per investor on indirect jobs, um, there's a statistical formula, there's business economists who project this, and that indirect jobs could include construction jobs in certain cases. So the people who are actually building the hotel, the people who are actually going to staff the hotel, and uh, other businesses that arise around the hotel. Uh, so let's say now McDonald's goes in right across the street or a dry cleaner, you can rely on those jobs. Whereas if you are investing in your own business, you will have to create the 10 full-time jobs. Those jobs have to be held by US workers who are authorized 
to work in the United States. So sometimes that can be a lot trickier than it sounds because there are pe there's over 11 million undocumented people living in America. People have fake social security cards. They have fake permanent residency cards. I see these cards every single day of my life. And a lot of time, I can't tell the difference between a fake or a real card. And suddenly you get a request for evidence from the government and says, ah, so-and-so social security doesn't match up you scrambling to create more jobs or more um, people in those 10 jobs so that you can fulfill the requirements. And that can be tricky if you're actually not in the United States running your 800 to a million dollar business. So you touched on, on some really interesting things here in talking about the, the creation of, of jobs and maybe in looking at just the EB-5 process, and this is going to be oversimplification, so please, please forgive me for that. But, you know, when I think of EB-5, I, I look at it, you know, from the investor standpoint in, in two phases. And please, um, you know, maybe you can discuss a little bit more detail as to what each of these two steps entail. But the way that I look at it is you have the I-526 stage where the uh, U.S. government is looking at the project, but also just verifying the source of that $800,000, right? Like they're trying to prove where that $800,000 came from, which is the investment amount now. And then the, the second stage is the 829 stage where the U.S. government is verifying that those jobs were actually created, right? Each investor needs to create 10 jobs. And we talked about the benefits of investing through a regional center where you get credit for your direct and, and your indirect jobs. But maybe if you, I love this graphic that you have here, um, because I think it really captures what the process is about. And, and maybe if you could talk a little bit through just the overall process as the investor thinks about, um, you know, what this looks like. Okay. So um, I will start right at the top. Uh, the first step would be finding a reputable regional center, um, doing your research on who they are, how many projects they've done, how many approval rates at the five to six stage, which I'll go into a little bit later. I don't know if my arrow is pointing at the chart properly, but um, how many approvals they have at the first stage, which is the five to six stage. And Equally or more importantly, how many approvals do they have at the 829 stage? Just out of history, when I started doing this, there were four regional centers in the United States. Today, wow. every day I get a brochure from the next best, greatest regional center promising very high returns and great investments. And some of them are, look really good. And I personally have invested in their things. Um, but when I invest, it's $5,000, it's not 1 million. So if I lost the money, it's not the end of the world. But I wouldn't recommend them to my clients because they either are a brand new regional center that does not have a 526 approved, or more importantly, they haven't been in business long enough to have 829s approved. So it's very important to go with a conservative regional center. Um, First pathways may not be happy with me, but this is not a good investment, guys. You want two things. You want your money back and you want your green card. Uh, I'm not a finance person, but if you want to put $800,000 into Microsoft, you probably get a better return on your money or Google. Um, so it's important to understand that any um, dividends or interest you get is great but it's a bonus. It's really a bonus. It's not what you're looking for. You want two things. So the first step would be finding a regional center that you're comfortable with. You probably will have to sign a non-disclosure agreement so they can release their various project information. You can then look at their projects with an attorney, an immigration attorney, a business attorney, or your wealth advisor, Investec does that. There's lots of places to do it. Um, your lawyer and the regional center would get information from you. Um, one of the key things the government is very concerned about is illegal activities. Where did your money come from? 
that they're very worried about drug running, laundering, all sorts of things. So they want to see that you have earned your money from a legitimate source. And how I like to tell my clients, it's like one of those things we played when we were kids, dot to dot. You literally are going to trace back from the time you wired the money to the regional center all the way to how you actually earned the money. So that is key and is a very high source of denial if you cannot prove your source of funds. Luckily for South Africans, the banking system is very, very sophisticated in South Africa. And uh, SARS is South African Revenue Service is also very sophisticated. So generally, the government has been very pleased with the type of documentation coming out of South African banking system, out of SARS, SARS clearance, all that kind of stuff, tax returns. So it's sophisticated. Often I'd get clients from various parts of the world where banking is not as sophisticated and the culture is to keep the money under your mattress. Well, how are you going to prove to the government, I've got 800000 to invest, but I'm only earning $20,000 a year. Where is that money coming from? So that is the, what the government will be, what your lawyer will be spending the biggest part on is your source of funds in the beginning. They will also review the documentation from the regional center to ensure that it complies with immigration law. I do not review documents to see that it's a good business decision. Obviously, if something jumps out at me, I would alert you to that. But my job is to notify you that the project documentation provided by the regional center comply with immigration law. Also, unfortunately, you can review those documents, but you're not going to be able to change anything, or it's very unlikely, because there's going to be hundreds of investors in the project, and the, uh, the regional center has hired their own counsel, who is not me. Um, I represent my interests are with the investor. The regional center has their own attorneys who are immigration lawyers, they are SEC lawyers, they are corporate lawyers. It's a whole team that creates um, thousands of pages of documents. When we file something, we probably killed five trees per person. <laughs> so the first stage is you get information from the on the various projects from the regional center. You choose a project you like. You uh, retain immigration counsel. You will complete a ton of information for your immigration counsel and provide documentation primarily on source of funds. You will also need to provide unabridged birth certificates, marriage certificates, military records, um, divorce, certified divorce decree. Why I tell you that now is as you may know, there are long delays in South Africa in getting unabridged birth certificates and marriage certificates and military records in some instances. So if you are considering the process, even if you don't retain council now or a regional center, go ahead and start getting those unabridged birth and marriage certificates. You're going to need them one day anyway, even if you don't go with this. So that's the first step. And those are the two blue bubbles at the top. The Immigration Council, in conjunction with the Regional Centre, will prepare an application called a 526E Immigrant Petition by Regional Centre, which will have information on the project in the application, and it will have information on the investor. Um, there are huge... Uh, documents relating to the project um, that have been provided either when getting this project previously approved or um, with this, such as, you know, subscription agreements, public uh, private placement memorandums, limited partnership agreements, operating agreements, things like that. That would then be filed and that is what's called the first stage of the green card. 
The law has recently changed, which is great for investors who are in a rush, in that you can now, you don't have to wait for the 526E petition to come into the, to be approved before you come into the United States. You can actually come into the United States on a non-immigrant visa, such as a student visa, a non-immigrant work visa, or even a visitor's visa, and 90 days later file the middle stage, I like to call it adjustment of status, work authorization permit, and travel permit. Those, the 485 will allow you to stay in the United States and live here while you are waiting for the green card. Which so Karen, I think, Karen, you bring up a really great point um, in, in talking about how the program has evolved over the years. Because really up until recently, the program in terms of the investment amount and, and some of these other things that you're talking about didn't change until like, very recently, I mean, like a couple of months ago, really. Um, it's a little <laughs> bit longer than that. But I guess what what my question would be, you know, whenever investors are looking at processing times and like those things, you go to the USCIS website, for example, and the last time I checked, it, it took 58 and a half months for your I-526 to be, to be approved. And USCIS has said that by the end of this year, they plan to be at six months, which, which we hope that they it. do, which we hope that they do. Um, but, you know, I think our experience has been that, you know, typically that's that seems like it's going to be a little bit of an ambitious goal. But maybe if you could talk about just the the advantage of, of what you're saying, that if you're here in a non-immigrant visa, um, it sounds like it's a game changer from uh, what was done previously, where you just could not come in under any circumstances and really would have had to have waited those 15 and a half months. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that also. Okay, so let's like go back six years about. Six years ago, it took approximately two years for the five to six petition to be approved. Only then could your case be transferred to the National Visa Center if you were overseas, or if you were in the United States already on some other visa, only then could you file the final stage or the stage of the green card, which would allow you to permanently live in the United States, work in the United States and travel. It took about two years. As of today, it is significantly backlogged. And the first stage, I am getting approvals of case of the five to six that were filed in 2018. So the wait times have increased significantly. However, just last year, the law allowed a change that said you do not, if you are already in the United States on some other visa, you can file your 485 adjustment of status before the 526 is approved, and that will allow you to wait in the United States for however long it takes to get the 526 approved. And Would you have is, permission to travel and, and, and to work uh, as, as well? So concurrently with filing the adjustment of status, we file a work authorization permit, which would allow you to work for anybody or yourself in the United States. That is currently taking about six months from filing. We also concurrently file what's called an I-131 travel permit, which would allow you to travel overseas while you're waiting for the 526 to be approved. You are not allowed to travel outside the United States until you get that travel permit. It is very important that uh, investors understand that. That travel permit is taking about nine months. If you leave the United States before you get that travel permit, you have potentially abandoned your entire application and it will be very hard to come back to the United States. 
So it's very important that investors understand that time frame. But the great news is, hypothetically, if you say I'm ready to leave South Africa tomorrow, I have a visitor's visa, you can come in. 90 days later, we can file the 485, the 765, the 131. You can enroll your kids in school and wait here for as long as it takes. If they speed up times to six months again, which I just, I'm not a gambling person, but I just don't see that happening. Whether they take six months or five years, it doesn't really matter because for all intents and purposes, you can do anything you want in the United States. You can live here. Um, as I said, kids can go to school. You can own property. You can open up a business. You can go work for somebody. It's basically you living. Here. It's just a matter of waiting for that five to six approved to be approved, which would give you what's called a conditional green card. That green card is valid for two years. Two, uh, two years later, well, actually one year and nine months before expiration of that green card, we file what's called an 829 application to lift conditions on the green card so that you can get your permanent green card, which is valid for 10 years. Uh, the 10 years is just you know, renewing it every 10 years is uh, not a hard thing at all. It's very easy. Most people do it themselves. Or after five years, you could actually apply for citizenship. At the and that's the ultimate goal, right? Is the, the ultimate goal is, is, is to get past that 829 stage, verify that your jobs were created, and then obtain that permanent green card. Correct. Correct. Citizenship is optional. Some people want to become U.S. citizens and get U.S. passports. Some people, for whatever reasons, or the countries that they are citizens of, won't allow dual citizenship. So it's a personal choice. South Africa allows dual citizenship. Um, at the 829 stage, we basically give them everything we gave in the 526 regarding the source of fund. But we rely heavily on the regional center because at this stage, the regional center has to show that the project was created in accordance with the business plan, that the jobs, 10 full-time jobs were created for investors. So essentially at this stage, the investor is at the mercy of the regional center to provide the proper documents. So that's why it's also very important to go with the regional center with proven track records in getting 829s approved. Because God forbid you go with a regional center that doesn't have the experience or there's fraud or something and you can't produce the documents that are really out of your control, you could lose your investment and in your green card. So um, it's very important to go with the regional center that has that experience. We show them payroll records, uh, that the jobs were created, that the project was created, the hotel was developed and so on. And then you get your full green card. And I think that's where, you know, First Pathways really um, is able to just lean on its experience and track record where we have a hundred percent track record in investors. Uh, obtaining a permanent residency. And I think that the other step to that is how do I get my money back? Am I, am, am I going to get my money back? Have, has the regional center actually completed the uh, cycle? And I think for First Pathways that we got started back in 2008, you know, we have returned capital to uh, in investors from several of, of our projects. And so I think that's where, you know, they're Maybe other projects out there um, that are newer, just like you said, that, that, that could be good, and, and they could be. But whenever you're looking at something like EB-5, that is such an intimate decision, right? Because it's not just an investment, but it's a family decision. You know, sometimes you're doing it for your children so they can study in the U.S. and you could take advantage of paying tuition at U.S. Uh, residency costs rather than the international student costs. Or maybe it's a family that, that that's just migrating from the U.S. And, and wants to realize the 
American dream. You know, the, those decisions are really important. And, you know, when you look at an EB-5 investment, I would agree with you that in terms of if you're just looking at it from a return perspective, that's probably not the best way to uh, look at it. You know, I think, you know, EB-5 projects are structured in many different ways. Uh, you know, the one that we have right now is more of a capital preservation play, you know, without getting into the weeds of debt versus equity. It, it's a debt uh, a product where we're acting like a lender, we're acting like a bank. Um, and so that in and of itself, just by definition, typically is going to be, from an investment standpoint, a capital preservation play. Um, and so I think being able to separate the high return aspect of it from a capital preservation, realizing the American dream is something that's so intimate and so important, is it, something that you know, an investor should, should focus on. And, and that's something that we could provide information uh, on as investors go through the due diligence, uh, due diligence process. Um, you mentioned some things that, that were really interesting as well as, you know, families that are going through the process and making uh, decisions. You mentioned the uh, student angle as well. And Sonia, you're located in, in South Africa and have been in the EP5 industry for many years. What are some of the things that, that you've seen in terms of EB-5 evolving uh, throughout the years? And also, if, if you could discuss just some of the individual relationships that, that you've made and, and how um, you've helped them realize the American dream. Oh, I think you're on mute, Sonia. Thank you, Manuel. Apologies for my mute. Uh, yes, so, um, you know, as Karen was saying earlier, each case and each family or each individual um, has their own requirements or their own need for coming to the United States. So typically the type of person who'd be interested in EB-5, um, you know, literally has to show their intent of wanting to live in the United States. Um, like Karen was saying, if I might uh, digress a little bit, um, Let's say, for instance, uh, the investor doesn't want to get his citizenship. Um, he can then apply uh, for his EB-5 through his spouse, for instance. So, um, yes, just one thing that is great about EB-5, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, do you really have to live where the project is? And the answer is no. I mean, you can live anywhere. And um, as Karen was saying, you know, kids can be educated in the U.S., um, they get in-state tuition, which is a huge saving for the family. I mean, if you look at what the cost of education, private education is in South Africa, those are just one of the great benefits that you have. Um, and then, yes, I mean, just recently I had an investor and um, they may be on the line today, um, you know, asking whether their spouse could work. And of course, um, that would enable their spouse to be able to get a job if that's what they wish. Um, I think some of the motivating factors, uh, you know, in South Africa and how it's fluctuated, you know, over the last decade, um, I think it's a big part of it is security. Um, you know, people have uh, either experienced directly or indirectly they've, they've uh, succumbed to crime, which is often cases violent crime. And um, they want the freedom, you know, where the children can work, walk to school. Um, you know, you can take your bicycles on a weekend and go and cycle. Everyone can go down to the beach or wherever you are, or, you know, and not feel any threat or you've got that constant tension, you know, that you find in South Africa, you're always looking around, you know, before you pull up to your gate at home, um, you know, in a shopping center and you're holding your kids close, uh, you know, just, just the feeling when you get off the plane, I think, um, what a lot of people say and what I've experienced and my own children have experienced um, and my own family, get off the plane in the United States and it's freedom. It's like this heavy weight is lifted off your shoulders and you literally feel it. So, yeah, and, you know, just, just looking at the education in South Africa, unfortunately, um, our universities just, you know, you cannot take somebody that's just qualified as a doctor or let's say you've been a doctor for the last 30 years and you now, now want to go and practice in the United States and, you're, and you were educated in South Africa and you got your university degree here, it's not going to be recognized then. So I think a big motivating factor for a lot of people, and I mean, we've even had families where the wives want to go do their doctorates or whatever it is they want to do um, 
you know, the, the education will be recognized globally, you know, once you get it from a first world country like the United States. And um, if I can just maybe go through some of the issues, how EB5 has fluctuated. I mean, South Africa is in a state of flux all the time. There's always something happening politically. Mm, there's, there's issues, yes, Chris will go into the electricity issue. That's a very recent issue, although it's been going since 2016. But going way back, um, my background, I actually uh, was heavily involved with the International Chambers of Commerce and worked you know, with the British and um, also with the Israelis. And you know, if you look at our procurement policies that came in through BE and broad-based Black economic empowerment, yes, it's great. It's great for transformation and things like that. But it actually, a lot of people felt threatened at the time. And I think that was a big motivating factor um, you know, when you procure, you have to procure and, you know, you've got to have your BE certificate and, you know, some businesses were wholly uh, family owned businesses, very thriving and successful businesses, and they didn't want to part, you know, shareholding with people that they didn't know. So I think that was a big motivating factor, um, you know, back then and still today, most probably for, you know, family owned businesses. The land appropriation without compensation, um, everyone knows about that. Um, you know, I've had personal friends that um, their properties have been on the radar where they've put up warehouses and businesses and their land has been earmarked. And it's really just the uncertainty, you know, that of, of the day and age where you're in or, you know, land appropriation, this talk has been going on for, for a very long time. Um, employment equity, that's great, but the Employment Equity Act has actually limited skills in South Africa, unfortunately. And that's also another factor, you know, the corruption in government um, is just appalling. And, you know, a lot of people are just so tired of um, all these empty promises and nothing actually really gets done. And where we're sitting today, I mean, if you look back a decade where we were and you compare your roads and, I mean, we all have this frustration of potholes. I mean, you know, I'm going to go buy another car now. I'm going to buy, buy four, uh, four by four because my sedan's just not actually coping with our roads. And I mean, it's it's in pockets. Anyone could go drive down the road to the spa to Craig Hall, and uh, there's these massive craters. You know, even even Fourth Avenue, that um, oh, sorry, it's Seventh Avenue going up to Rosebank. I mean, there's massive holes in the road that at night you can't see them. So. Yeah, people are getting tired of the infrastructure that's just falling apart in the country. Also, the rand dollar. I think if one looks back um, and the rand was very um, strong against the dollar, you know, we found that there was a lot of interest in EB5 back then. Um, right now, I think it's sitting at 18.12 when I looked last today. Um, a lot of people are saying, well, I rather want to wait. What do I do? And you know, we don't advise people, but that is a decision you need to make for yourself. I'd rather personally have my money in the United States, um, in a first world country, um, you know, without restrictions, you know exactly what uh, is going to happen to your money because everything is well regulated and there's good corporate governance, you know, in a, in a country like the United States, still the strongest economy by far. And uh, yeah, and I don't want to get too depressing about anything, but you know, you have your... Um, your social unrest, and you just want your families to be safe at the end of the day. So I think uh, that's sort of covered everything from my side, Manuel, unless you've got any questions. Yeah, maybe um, you and Karen can talk a little bit of, uh, about this as well, because I think sometimes when when people think of EB-5, it is a, hey, we we have to leave uh, our, our country of origin, where, where, where we're from. But really, you know, I've also noticed in, in my experience of working with EB-5 investors throughout the year is that, you know, the EB-5, you know, some investors are looking at this as an option, that 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 is an option to have, to uh, prepare. Uh, maybe, Karen, if, if, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, I think sometimes you have you know, in the U.S., you know, once you become a, a permanent green, uh, green card holder, you know, there are certain residency requirements that need to be fulfilled. Um, but it also doesn't mean that you can never go back uh, or, or something like that, right? That, you know, it is an EB-5 option that sometimes people just have uh, in, in the event that, 
you know, they decide that the move to the U.S. is, is going to be a permanent one, obviously taking into account the residency requirements that go along with this. Okay, so that's a great point, Manuel. Um, immigration is becoming a lot stricter with this topic. In the past, I've had clients who got a green card, whether it's through EB-5 or some other mechanism. It doesn't really matter once you have the green card, how you got it. And they would come in once every 10 years or mm -hmm. whatever, once every five years and stay for a vacation for two weeks and leave. I will tell you those days are over. They are over, over, over. A permanent residency is exactly what it implies. Permanently residing in the United States. So let's say you got your permanent resident card today or your conditional permanent resident card today. I do not want you to be outside the United States in the best case scenario for more than 179 days at a time. Worst case scenario, 364 days at a time. Having said that, if you come into the United States for a week or so, once every six months, they are eventually going to stop you and say, you are not residing in the United States. And they could potentially take away your green card. So if you believe that you're not going to be able to live here for the next 10 years, don't do it now. Just don't do it. It's getting costly and very expensive for people who are placed in removal proceedings because they haven't maintained a residence. Maintaining a residence includes living in the United States. It's more than just filing tax returns, which you must do. It's more than owning assets in the United States. It's evidencing that you permanently reside here. So that is really something people need to weigh up. Now, there is something called a re-entry permit. If you know that you getting your green card, but for some reason, a good reason, you cannot move immediately. For example, you're under a job contract for three years or you are studying at college for three years, you can get a re-entry permit, which basically says to the US government, I'm not abandoning permanent residency. I just need this exception. And they will grant it for you generally for one to two years. And that re-entry permit can be renewed, but I would say, probably after three times you're out of luck in getting it renewed. So that is a tough thing. They are not flexible anymore. You may get lucky. You may arrive at a, a port of entry and they're so busy, they just say, hi, welcome to the United States, and you come in. And they may not stop you. I do have clients who just get lucky. Other people get grilled about it. And I've had some horrible cases where one fair wife goes and she comes back to South Africa with a kid who's finishing school and the father and other kid are in the United States and they have been separated for many years and in some cases have had to start a process all over again. So it's very important to know if you're making this move you need to make it. A lot of people are under the impression I can get a permanent green card, keep it in my back pocket, and when all hell breaks loose, I'll hop on the next plane. Those days are over. And I think also that that really speaks to the importance of, you know, you mentioned the importance of working with a regional center that has that track record. And, and I would just emphasize back to you that it's very important to work with an immigration attorney like yourself that understands this whole process and understands these these nuances. Um, you you brought up the uh, student aspect of it, right? And I think that you know whenever you're a student, one of the things that I've seen, and obviously I stay away from like the the immigration legal side of it. I speak on the project, obviously, but uh, you know, in if you're a student on an F one, uh, but you have the the EB five as well, just if you can talk about, you know, how that gives you a little bit more freedom, especially when you're comparing that, you know, maybe to the 
the H-1B, where you have to depend on a corporation to sponsor you, right? Because I think what we see is that, you know, for people that are looking to be five, a lot of the time you look at it as them getting it for their children so they can study in the U.S., but the other side of it is once you're done studying, it does give you a little bit more freedom to work wherever uh, you'd actually like to. Right, right. And for a lot of the EB-5s where the parents are actually, the children are still younger, so the parents are filing, they don't want to go through employment where they've had their own successful company in South Africa and clock in at nine to five and, you know, be at the mercy of an employer, hoping that they'll renew their temporary visa, hoping that they'll sponsor them for green cards, working at a job that may not be what they said it would be. And they go, you know, I've had my own successful business for many years. I, I just don't want to be an employee of somebody. So this gives them the freedom to work if they want to. If they don't want to work and they don't have to work, great. They don't have to work. Yeah. And, and so at, at this point, I'd like to switch tracks just a, a little bit, you know, because I think both of you have done a really good job of explaining the motivations of why a South African investor would look at the EB-5 program. And Chris, you know, I'd like to uh, shift over to you. And, you know, you want, you have a very deep understanding of just some of the macroeconomic uh, drivers. And, you know, through the CRA, you put out some great information that just tells people what is actually happening in, in South Africa now. So maybe if, if you could talk a little bit about just some of the macroeconomic factors and how they, they've evolved over time and, and what you're projecting uh, to happen um, here in the next uh, couple of years. Thanks, Manuel. This is unplanned, but I guess the best uh, example of some of the failing state issues is the power outages. And at the moment, I've got my rechargeable light bulbs going, but of course, not nearly as good lighting as one would hope. So I will switch off my camera just for this little bit so you can focus on the graphics and not try and lip read, you know, what I'm saying. So <laughs> I'll share my <laughs> screen okay. now and you can all see. A mysterious vibe. Uh, oh, yeah, fair enough, you know, <laughs> helping to, to shroud the numbers, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, just confirm for me that you can see. Yes, we, I uh, do see that. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we're just going to highlight some of the bigger indicators. So here, for example, we take um, quarter on quarter GDP growth for, for various selected countries and regions. Why is this important? Well, I can you know throw numbers at, at all of you you know for many hours, but basically higher GDP growth translates into a higher quality of life, um, higher quality of life for you, for your family, more business formation, more economic activity, more job creation, um, a general upliftment of all boats over the long run. So you can see here from we went from 2010 to 2022. You can see, of course, the big dip that all these regions experienced during COVID and the lockdowns, but the bounce back that came from that. When you look at the red line, that is the US, and on average, it is higher versus other regions like South Africa, like China, and like the Euro area. So if you're in a region that has better average GDP growth, uh, you'll bounce back faster. That doesn't mean that things won't fluctuate, that you won't experience some sort of disturbance every now and then with, for example, pandemics. Uh, we can't rule out that something like this might happen again in the future. But on average, there's a bounce back and the trend line then increases upwards again into the next few years. Whereas for a country like South Africa, more exposed to global shocks at the moment, the Reserve Bank, for example, forecasting South Africa's growth rate at 0.2% for this year, you don't have the sort of substantive investment and economic growth that you need. For a vibrant economy at this point in time this might change we've got a general election coming up next year but for the short to medium term things looking quite difficult from that perspective from the the substantive gdp growth moving to our next slide we're just looking at unemployment and again we've got our four regions the us china the euro and south africa now for china we can't always count on the numbers coming from there we do our best that we can from the national bureau of statistics of china so you can see the gray line um, you can see, interestingly, for South Africa, again, when we went through COVID and lockdowns, a dip in the unemployment rate. This might be explained by people not registering as receiving grants, for example, as one particular example, um, not being part of that workforce. But you then again, you see the trend line on average in South Africa has been a much higher 
unemployment rate. At the moment, it was sitting between 45 and 50% of South Africans uh, considering themselves, unfortunately, part of unemployment. Again, unsustainable figures. Whereas you can see with a place like the US, you had the increase in unemployment during COVID and lockdowns, but how it's come back down to its sort of average. So again, this is not to say that any particular country has all the solutions, nowhere is perfect. But on average, there's going to be less unemployment in a place like the US, a more vibrant economy where more investment comes from various different sources. Moving on to consumer inflation. So this global picture that I wanted to highlight, again, our four regions, um, China, South Africa, the US, and the Euro. Here you can see, regardless almost of where you are, for the foreseeable future, you're going to deal with higher inflation. Higher inflation filters into things like higher prices, higher costs. On average, you're going to see this be remaining quite sticky, trending ever upwards for some regions. A country like the US is now trying to ensure that it does more local manufacturing. This might assist to protect, protect itself from some of the global factors of inflation. A country like South Africa is very reliant on imported goods import, and imported manufactured goods that exposes us more to global inflation if that increases. So again, do you take that risk of remaining in a country like, like South Africa where the inflation will remain higher for longer versus where you go to a place like the US where there could be spikes, but on average, it can weather some of these global storms a bit better. Next up, just to look at US specifically, household wealth and nominal GDP. This is not just to sort of guarantee outcomes. If, if I or any politician maybe promised you the world, you should be quite, uh, <laughs> quite skeptical of that. No one can promise you perfect utopia. But if you look at places like the US, the average wealth is better than other places. You look at US, US household wealth and then nominal GDP. Again, the trend line increasing ever upwards where there's a better chance that you'll have higher GDP as, as an individual and in terms of your household wealth versus in other regions. Again, we had the dip around COVID, but you can see largely the trend line ever upwards. Focusing just on South Africa, we look at the electricity situation, a big pain point in the South African risk scenario, along with unemployment and crime. Um, this is some data that we pulled from ESCOM, the, the uh, government-run electricity provider, or in this case, maybe not, we shouldn't consider them a provider, but more a restrictor of electricity. So this is from their own reports. Um, this is from the 20th of March this year. If you look at um, the data and we translate that into the forecast per week, at least they will be short 2000 megawatts every week through March next year, which means at least stage two of load shedding. It could go up to stage eight, stage nine. Basically, load shedding means um, ESCOM cannot meet the demand coming from the grid. It cannot supply the adequate demand. So it has to shut off parts of the economy, part of the grid, to ensure that we don't have a grid collapse. Um, that's another potential risk. We cannot rule out a grid collapse. Uh, it is not impossible. At the moment, it is improbable. But do you want to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, that sort of risk point where at any point there could be a grid collapse if you have the sort of perfect storm of issues? Do you now as we're going into winter, you are, of course, going to have higher demand, and that puts more pressure on the grid itself. Uh, coming then to the last slide, we look at a few scenarios sort of from the global perspective. Um, firstly, if you look at on the top right-hand side, if central banks, um, sorry, let me just go back. If central banks get a handle on inflation and economic growth takes off, you have the on track and on schedule scenario. However, if you've got inflation persisting, uh, growth stagnating, and central banks having to continue hiking rates, you've got the fire in the engine room. On the other hand, you've got stagnation and inflation persisting. So you've got regression. You don't, you don't have growth. You've got a sort of destruction environment. You've got derailment. And then lastly, decoupling with sort of the persistence of the status quo. So the question I want to ask, and again, not to say that you must do one thing, you either must remain in South Africa, must go to the US, must go anywhere else, is just if any of these scenarios happen, where on average would you do better versus somewhere else? Where might your upside be higher? Where are some of the risks a bit lower? These are some of the questions that we try and work through, present to, to you and, and to our various clients and engagements. How does one make sense of it? Well this might be one useful way to decide if this is something that you want to uh, pursue in this global context that, in which we find ourselves.
Uh, with hey, that, Chris. thank you. I'll uh, stop sharing there. That's okay. Hey, Chris, one, one quick question. Um, great job on the presentation, really good information. One of the things that, that I'd like to ask as well as, you know, when you look back, you know, maybe over the course of the last, you know, let's say five or 10 years, um, you know, how, how do you see, do you project as to how things will look over the next five to three years, or are you just taking a uh, hip uh, things from a, like a historic uh, vantage point? And then how often do you send your, your, your reports out? Because I think it really has some good information. And the last thing is I would encourage our attendees to please submit questions as we're coming to the end of the webinar. We'd be more than happy to be uh, here to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Just in terms of the, the sort of projecting, we, we do that as well um, with our scenario planning, that sort of thing. At the moment, I can say globally, the forecast is for the next three to five years is sort of higher than expected inflation. It's going to take longer for it to come down. That means that's, you know, the US Fed, for example, might, it might not continue hiking rates, but it might keep it longer, uh, higher for longer. So we might not see cuts maybe before 2025 it might keep it quite high as it tries to get a, a handle on inflation the us uh, us job market incredibly resilient and we're seeing that low unemployment rate so it's quite incredible to look at um, i think for other regions you're going to see even higher inflation in some regards and then you've got the other global risk point of what we're calling friend shoring or decoupling between the us and China. And again, this idea of bringing supply chains and value chains maybe back to the US or at least moving them to other regions, maybe in Africa, for example, there's a great opportunity for African countries. We're seeing that as a big risk point. How do countries deal with, with that scenario in the global trade space? So for the time being, risks to one's growth, to one's wealth, if you can find places where that wealth is somewhat not protected because it can't be 100% guaranteed, but you might have better returns. You're going to have it in a place like the US where there's just more innovation, um, there's more investment. Someone posted a picture of um, the, the latest rocket ship launched by Elon Musk. It launched, of course, it exploded, but it was still a successful launch. And the caption was, this is where the future is happening. So succeeding, failing, but you're trying different ways, you're investing, you're pushing technology where does one want to be versus where you might not want to be? That sort of idea. Yeah, that 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 reference uh, is also close to my heart because that happened in my hometown uh, as well, down in uh, Brownsville, Texas. But thank you so much for that. I have a couple quick questions to ask. And uh, Karen, maybe if you want to take this uh, first one is, is, is the investment guaranteed? Uh, and so I think that, you know, all of us have worked at EB-5, uh, could answer that, but I'd like you to answer it from the uh, just immigration standpoint of just how the EB-5 program is actually set up. So the purpose of the EB-5 program, which we touched on, is job creation, is primarily the main motivator of the government. But it's an investment that specifically states in the regulations it must be at risk. <coughs> so it cannot be guaranteed. Having said that, I have worked on projects where the investment is not guaranteed by the re regional center, but it has been guaranteed by a third party. Um, depending, you know, the devils are in the details that can be allowed, but generally it must be at risk. There have been cases and there's case law that says where the regional center or the developer even guarantees the investment, it does not meet the requirements of being at risk and potentially can lead to a denial of the application. Okay, thank you so much for that. And then um, one more question and then we can wrap up here as well. You know, just talk, it's just with regards to the investments that uh, FPP has, uh, First Pathway Partners. And so we do have one, it's uh, located in the Coachella Valley. It's a $613 million project. It is a development project. And I think there, you know, historically what you've seen in EB-5 uh, and where we've built our track record as well is through real estate projects where you're able to create a lot of jobs. Uh, again, talking about the direct and the indirect jobs. Um, the nice thing about this one we just heard last week is that all jobs have already been created. 
Um, so the investors know that at the A29 stage, we've already at least fulfilled that requirement. And you know, definitely please contact us with more questions that we can get into more details. I don't wanna get into the weeds of uh, our, our investment now, but happy to talk to you about it uh, as you reach out to us. And I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for joining us and thank you everybody who attended online. Please reach out and I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Thank you all again, really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Karen Lee. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Thank you.